again. My name is Kai Bird. I'm the executive director of the Leon Levy Center here at CUNY for biography. This is our 11th year. We've given 44 fellowships and uh, there are nearly 20 books have been published. Um, <clears throat> and before we begin, I have a, a few announcements. Um, I, I want to boast about a few things. Uh, first, just a few weeks ago, the Alfred Sloan Foundation awarded the Le Leon Levy Center a three-year, $330,000 grant to allow us to fund a fifth fellowship. We give four every year. Now we're, we'll be able to give a fifth $72,000 fellowship. This one devoted to biographers working on scientific figures. Um, now we're about to publicize this new fellowship in the New York Review of Books and elsewhere, but I hope you can all get the word out by word of mouth. Um, our current fellows this year are Rebecca Donner, working on a biography of Mildred Harnack, Stephen Heyman, a biography of Louis Bromfield, Jennifer Homans, a biography of George Balanchine, and Samantha Subramanian for a biography of the British scientist J.B.S. Haldane. Um, Secondly, I'm very pleased that last month the CUNY Board of Trustees voted to approve a two-year master's program in biography and memoir. Um, this program still needs actually official approval from the New York State Board of Education, but we expect this to happen by December. And so we are planning a campaign to recruit 10 to 15 students of biography and memoir for the autumn of 2019. This will be the first ever graduate degree program in biographer, biography and memoir anywhere in the country. And again, I hope you can help us to get the word out, not only for young people interested in graduate school, but also mid-career folks and seniors who might be interested in learning how to write a memoir. Tonight, we're here for a very special conversation about the life of an artist. Kathy Curtis is a former LA Times staff writer, a graduate of Smith College. She holds a master's degree in art history. Um, Kathy was elected just recently to a two-year term as president of the Biographers International Organization, BIO. Congratulations. And I'm happy to say that we are partners with BIO in many ways. Last May, we hosted their fabulous annual conference on biography. More than 250 people participated, and there were more than 20 panels. We're doing the same thing next May 18th here at CUNY. BIO is a terrific organization. If you're all at, at all interested in biography, you should join and get their very informative monthly newsletter. Kathy's previous books include Restless Ambition, Grace, Hardikin, Painter, and Alive Still, Nell Blaine, American Painter. Her new book is, as you see over there, A Generous Vision, The Creative Life of Elaine de Kooning. Our moderator this evening is Claudia Roth Pierpont, who was herself a Leon Levy Biography Fellow in 2010-11. She's been a contributor to The New Yorker since 1990 and became a staff writer in 2004. Her subjects have included Friedrich Nietzsche, Catherine Hepburn, Mae West, Orson Welles, uh, and she's most recently the author of Roth Unbound, a writer in his books in 2014, and more recently, American Rhapsody, Writers, Musicians, Movie Stars, and One Great Building. I think that's about the Chrysler Building, right? Anyway, so I turn it over now to Claudia, who will conduct a, an interrogation of the author. <laughs> right. Thank you. First of all, please tell me if you can't hear us. We've been told the acoustics are very bad. Louder? Louder? All right. <laughs> From the start, louder. First, I want to say how much I admire Kathy's book. It's a, it's a great privilege and a treasure to have the first biography ever. Of an, of an American artist, Elaine de Kooning. And I would like to begin by asking Kathy sort of a hard one. I'm skipping my initial first question because she already showed you all the 
photographs of the paintings and told you where they can and cannot be found. And I have to say, as recently writing about Elaine de Kooning and a bunch of other women artists, it was, it's amazingly hard to simply lay your eyes on them in the flesh, the paintings. Even when they're owned, they're not exhibited. It's very, very hard to get people to pull them out of storage so you can actually see them. But here's what I want to start off with, because the beginning of your book kind of surprised me. All right, I, sh I should read from there, but I'm going to quote. So um, here you go. Um, I should say also, before I read you to yourself, you made me feel that of all the women artists of her era, she is the one I wish I'd known. She is the one I wish I'd been able to talk with. She seemed to have the greatest breadth of interest, the greatest generosity. She sounds like a wonderful talker, a wonderful thinker, as well as an important painter. So here's where you surprised me, right at the start, OK? <laughs> All right, so the book begins. Everyone knows that the painter Willem de Kooning was one of the titans of 20th century art. But few people realize that his wife, Elaine de Kooning, and here's where I expected you to say, was one of the, also one of the most important painters of the era, but you said, um, was um, a prime mover among artists. A prime mover among artists. Then you went on to say she was an incisive writer and you spoke about her gifts as a writer. And then you spoke of her as being a celebrated portrait painter of her time. And so I want to ask you really the hardest one first, if I may. How important was she as a painter to her time and to you? Um, or do you consider her painting as part of her general intellectual and social interest? Thank you, yes. <laughs> OK, I'll just, I, have um, okay. It's, I was uh, speaking uh, elsewhere in New York uh, some months ago. And a friend of mine, it was all going very nicely. And I should say that there was um, an art dealer in the audience who's trying to sell some paintings by Elaine. And um, this person I know in the audience said, uh, it was the last question. Everything was going OK. And she said, so you know, is, is Elaine uh, one of the major abstract expressionists? And I said, no. And the art dealer is like, oh, God. He was trying to say he brought two paintings to sell at this thing, you know. Um, but she wasn't. Um, she's an interesting painter. And I think she, her portraits um, stand up next to, let's say, Alice Neal's. Very different from Alice Neal, if you know her. But, um, but uh, I don't, as an abstract expressionist, I mean, her, her abstract paintings, are interesting, and we'll get into the why she was painting bulls so much, but um, the, the bull painting is the one that's at the Whitney that I showed. Um, uh, but she was not major. She did not um, you know, invent a new way of doing anything. Um, Joan, um, Joan Mitchell was the, uh, you know, the primo, the, the, the really great woman artist of the period, and I think how apparent was that at the time, though? I mean, do you, think, you, oh. do you think they had a sense of their different status among themselves? Or is this yeah. what history is sorting out now? Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I just don't believe in making ridiculous claims for people. I, she interested me as a person. Um, her, her vivacity, her generosity, all of this, well, you know. So you didn't go into it thinking, I will find that she is a more major artist than you ended up concluding. You, you found what you expected to find. But I don't expect to find anything. That's the whole thing. I'd come into it blind. She interested me. Well, can I say how I got to her? Yeah, please. Um, I was, when I wrote the um, Grace Hardigan book, um, one of the stories told to me was that Grace's uh, graduates, uh, Grace is well, she was born in New Jersey, uh, spent her major career in New York, and then was teaching at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And one of her graduate students, was, who was working as an assistant, was, had gone up to Elaine's for some reason, bringing, bringing her something. And uh, he said, so I'm going to be leaving in a few weeks uh, for New York. I'm going to start my career as a painter. And Elaine said, but what about Grace? And he said, what about her? And uh, Elaine pointed out that Grace was getting old, that she needed help. And so he stuck around. And um, it just, it's a story in itself. But, and he wound up, it was a very smart move on his part, because he became uh, the trustee of her estate. And he got her beautiful house and a whole bunch of things I don't think he should ever have, have gotten. But um, 
you know, that was the person she was, is my point. Elaine was always looking out for, for people and, you know, as, as an older woman. As a young woman, she was quite selfish. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. In fact, you also say that, well, this, this strikes fear and sadness in any writer's heart. She had many journals. She kept maybe between 100 and 300 notebooks. All of them disappeared. She intended to write a memoir. She either never got to it or whatever she did is gone. And you make a point at, while well, you describe this woman with this great joie de vivre and this wonderful personality that one thing she didn't reveal at all was suffering that you knew she must have gone through with the marriage, with her career, with everything. And you imply that in fact, in many ways, she was very hard to know. Did you find this, how, how did you get to know her then without the first-hand documents that maybe we hope are still out there somewhere? Or how did you begin to, since it was her rather than the canvases that really drew you, how did you penetrate her if you feel you were able to? Well, I don't know. It's up to the reader to, of course, decide if I was able to. But fortunately, there are letters. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a marvelous letter. She was a marvelous writer and a marvelous letter writer. Um, and of course, various people had you know, there were all the comments from, from, from others. Um, um, what was I going to say? Well, sometimes a subject you just know is harder than another subject. I once wrote about Dashiell Hammett, who was a major alcoholic, and I wanted to hang myself because it was impossible to get behind his eyes to know him. I think, with diff for example, with Grace Hardigan, some subjects are, it's easier for you to embrace who they are. To well, it. and Grace left a jour journals from the 50s mm -hmm. where she poured out her heart about her love life and her paintings. Mm -hmm. and, but um, coming back to, if it's not too circuitous, coming back to what you said about her, her suffering, mm -hmm. um, uh, Elaine's. When Elaine, um, uh, Elaine um, would speak about her mother as the person who introduced her to art, who had reproductions in the home of, you know, uh, Michelangelo and and a few female painters of the 19th century and introduced her to the literature and so on and so forth. But, um, and that seems to be true, but when Elaine was six years old, um, neighbors apparently, she was um, the eldest of four children in the Sheep's Head Bay uh, neighborhood of, of uh, Brooklyn. And um, neighbors discovered that the children seemed to uh, be dirty and, and didn't seem to be well fed. And so, um, you know, the Children's Protective uh, Services or whatever came, came in. And a couple of cops came and took her mother away. Now, this is a six year old girl. Her mother is taken away, screaming, kicking. Surely that leaves some kind of mark. Um, and I think. Uh, that and her mother. Her mother had some sort of mental illness. Um, Willem de Kooning's biographers tread rather gently, you know, cautiously. I mean, we biographers are not, um, you know, trained in, um, you know, in, in any field in which we can diagnose such things. But it was really clear she was a very bright woman, and maybe it was some sort of postpartum depression she had her four children, boom, 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 you know, in just a few years. And of course, in those years, Elaine was born in 1918. Um, you know, there was not very much attention paid to mothers, you know, suffering in, in these um, matters. But, um, oh, uh, skipping around a bit, but Elaine was born in 1918, but as far as she was concerned, she was born in 1920. That's what she made up when she was in her 20s. And so every time she quotes, she says, I was 14 when I did this, you think, okay, she was really 16, so then it was this date, you know. She was very young when she decided to be an artist, though, and when she met Willem de Kooning. Maybe you could fill us in a little about her schooling and what it was like to meet him and what the difference in their stature was when she did meet him. Um, well, uh, she dropped out of college because um, there, she, it, it dawned on her that there were only women. And she was always someone who enjoyed playing with, when as she was a child, she played only with boys. And she, she just loved to surround herself with men. And so she wound up going to something called the Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> School of, of Art <laughs> in New York. Um, and then um, there she uh, had an affair with a teacher. Um, but the main thing she got out of 
this, uh, knowing this man, was that he introduced her to, to de Kooning. And by that time, she'd moved on to another art school that was much more political. Um, but in, when she was 20, in, in 1938, she, met de, she was brought over to de Kooning's studio. And she, she just sort of instantly fell in love with his work, with him, with his beautiful, very, very pristine studio. You know, he was, he was Dutch. And um, he was then painting men. Um, and she felt that um, it was her introduction into his life that uh, allowed him to begin painting women. And indeed, he, he did mm -hmm. uh, paint her many times. Um, the great meeting story of the young female student going into the genius's studio and falling instantly in love and saying, he's a genius, I'm going to marry him. It doesn't only happen with her. Even in the same period, Ali Krasner tells exactly the same story about Jackson Pollock. You could switch them in the books and you wouldn't know the difference. I walked into his studio, bam. What was in either of their studios at the time was not what we come to think of as the great works of genius later on. And all these stories are a bit suspect. But what's fascinating, I think, is as opposed to Lee Krasner, who made herself subject to the genius of Jackson Pollock basically for her entire life, Elaine de Kooning is a very different woman who takes a very different tack and is basically no one's idea of a wife, and, and for how long does she consider herself even a student of his before she feels, I deserve my separate studio space, I deserve my separate stature. As an artist, I may be younger and just starting out in a woman, but that don't matter. Well, I mean, actually, in, in a way, all her life, she was a student of, of, of his. I mean, she would always say, Bill de Kooning always said, mm. um, for years and years, you know, after she left him in, in 1957, but I mean, she did, it was you know, very difficult. I mean, they were living in a very uh, small space. Imagine two people painting. I mean, he liked to whistle classical music, and she didn't like it. And you know, I mean, it was just two strong personalities. Um, and so she moved out, got her own studio. And then finally, um, I'm telling the story in a rather ragged way, but uh, finally, um, you know, they both had affairs all along. I mean, just. Uh, I thought you say she started it, though. But <laughs> am I wrong in that? I'm sorry. That she began having an affairs right away. Yeah, right away. That she yeah. was the one who wouldn't cook. That you have a lovely story about. He would. It, he would at least try and leave her a plate of cut up apples when he went off to the studio. And you say she couldn't even manage that. Yeah. Right? That was beyond her sense of where she might go if she became maybe too wifely, too subservient, or am I misreading you in that? No, no, you're, you're right. I mean, there, some of the stories you really wonder. I mean, there's a story about the sheets. Um, one of her brothers noticed that the sheets on the bed were getting rather gray. And so he said, well, you know, you could wash those sheets and put them out on the roof. Um, oh, I just have to say, the, how did they get the top floor? Because Elaine. T um, this is the building um, somewhere I have the, it's quite interesting all the places they lived. Um, yeah, this was on 156 West 22nd Street where, where Bill was already living. And Elaine managed to sweet talk the, um, the landlord into giving them the top floor, which was larger at less, for less money. Um, and it was $30 a month which is about $416 in today's money, which is still, imagine, 2,500 square feet. Um, but anyway, so the brother noticed that um, you know, these sheets were gray. He said, you can wash them in the tub. You can hang them you know, out on the clothesline on, on the roof. And he comes back six months later. I mean, that's how the story goes. And those sheets are still hanging there. They're stiff and, you know. Well, this is it's somewhat ridiculous. I mean, you know, did they buy new sheets? Did <laughs> Did they sleep without sheets? I mean, you know, some of these Let's stories. Let's take it are, as a, a metaphor for what she. I suppose, yeah. For, for her concerns with taking care of her house, I suppose. Yeah, she simply had no, no interest whatsoever. I mean, but it wasn't even that she didn't want to be her mother because her mother apparently had very little interest in this as well. So, mm -hmm. um, but but in a very important way, I think all her life she worried about becoming her mother in 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 a um, mental health sense. Um, and because her mind was teeming, uh, Elaine's mind was so teeming, is what I uh, can gather, with ideas and thoughts 
that she, um, her work was a way to kind of to focus and to channel this, this amazing energy she, mm -hmm. she always had. One of the things that is so interesting about the paintings that you all just saw flash by is how willing she was to paint abstractly when she wanted to and how willing she was to paint absolutely realistically and go pretty much against the tenor of the times. Um, as far as I understand it, she herself tended to dismiss the abstract works later on. She didn't think they were what was important to her. Portraiture, she said, was her addiction. It wasn't very in style at the time. Um, it meant she wasn't doing the most avant-garde work that was being done. Uh, what did it mean to her to take this kind of stance? And, and, and why was it so important to her to paint the people she knew? Does it have to do with this gregarious soul that she was? Or? Well, I think it was partly that it, Bill wasn't doing it. He had stopped painting people at that time. Um, well, recognizable people, let's, let's say. Um, and so it was her own thing. And um, it was a way, she was a really marvelous um, uh, draftsman. And it was a way to, to, to teach herself how to do a different thing. I mean, of course, she started with, with self-portraits. It's the obvious reason. And, and then she began painting people who hung around. Mm -hmm. um, there was a fellow called Joop Sanders, who was a, a Dutchman, a uh, friend of her husband's. And you know, so she, she painted him. And then, and then she began to meet people in the arts. And, you know, and that's how she painted mm -hmm. you know, writers and, 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 and other artists. Um, I mean, how, what, how would you, you, you already showed the portraits and I'm not sure I heard everything you said, but you brought up Alice Neal, who I think, if you think of a woman painter of portraits, you think of Alice Neal. And it's not that everybody was completely happy with the portraits that Elaine de Kooning painted. You pointed out Harold Rosenberg said he looked like what, some hotel owner. But nobody was afraid to have her paint their portraits, as they were afraid to have Alice Neal paint their portraits. Very famously in 1970, when Kate Millett was going to be on the cover of Time, and they thought, oh, we'll double the feminist wallop. We'll commission Alice Neal to paint a portrait of Kate Millett. To put Kate Millett said, no way is she painting my portrait and you're using it. Uh, so did she flatter people? What was she after in these portraits? Well, um, she she wasn't, I think, so much as so much flattery as empathy. She wanted to show people at their best. Um, but I just take a step back, though. What she was really looking for was her husband's notion of the glimpse. How you how how do you know someone you know you know Let's say someone you know is walking down the street, and you see them at a distance. You can't really see their face yet, but you know how they carry themselves. You, and that's how you recognize them. And it was that that fascinated her. Mm. Um, and also, another thing that really interested her in, in uh, portraying men, which she mostly did, was the way, uh, of course, in those days, men primarily wore a suit. Um, and the way the suit bisected the body, you know, the tie, the jacket, the pants. Um, and she's just interested in the geometry of it, you could say. So, I mean, there was always an abstract thing mm -hmm. working at the same time. But, but she um, really wanted to portray people, not maybe as they wished to be, but as perhaps as she wished mm -hmm. them to be. But she also painted faceless portraits, didn't she? Yes. Which is an oxymoron, if ever there was one. But what did that mean to her? Why, why did those happen? Yeah, I never. I don't know. I just had to guess. Um, I mean, again, it, it throws the emphasis on the posture. Um, somebody who knew her, one of her brothers actually, said that she tended to wipe out the faces when she, there was some emotional thing going on with her. When she, I'm reading between the lines here, but she had some kind of problem with the person. Mm -hmm. These were all people she knew well. I mean, she, obviously you have a portrait commission, you don't paint out the face <laughs> or you don't get paid. But, um, you know, these were, um, you know, when she, some of the portraits of her husband had, uh, at least one of them anyway, had a painted out face. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a Frank O'Hara without much of a face. But you can still tell but you who can, it is yeah, that by the sort of contrapposto. The snake stance. hips. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, one of the things I think we know, feel we know about the de Koonings is that when she enters his life, he begins to paint women, as you said. 
And the most famous de Kooning women are those very disturbing images from the early 50s. And some people defend them and say they're actually humorous. Women at the time, they're charming, they're funny. They're, um, some people at the time, maybe to protect them both, said, oh, it's about what, this, what has happened to women socially in our country. Some people were worried that it was literally Bill painting Elaine out of kind of emotional agony at the time because she was having a series of semi-public affairs. So whatever it is, there's a lot of anger, it looks like, in those women. And I want to get back to how much she, tell me what you think about them, but I'd also like, while you answer that, to tell me what you think about her anger, because you say she has it. You actually mention one portrait which you don't illustrate and which I have been unable to find, which is something called Bill at St. Mark's, where you say it's almost a, a depraved portrait of anger that for once it really leaked out. The, the, the charming face, the woman who was going to make everything lovely and you know bring flowers and make everything. For once, occasionally it seeped out. So can you talk about Bill's anger and Elaine's anger in portraiture? Um, but I, talking about Bill, uh, Bill though, I, I don't think he was angry. Um, in particular, I mean, he had a, he had a, his mother was just as bad in her own way as Elaine's mother. The two of them really should have met. I, I don't know that they, I guess they must have, but not to my knowledge. But anyway, um, um, you know, the thing, I just don't think you can say, you know, this, you know, he was painting, you know, as I'm sure Claudia. Well, there are all these but thoughts. There's even so at many the time. thoughts. I mean, and it's, you know, it's also very much about shape and form and, um, it, it's not just about, it, it, it's not a linear thing. You know, I am going to paint, you know, what I feel about women. It's, you, you know, it's... I grant there's formalism involved, and yet, and yet. He did say he always started with a beautiful woman, and somehow she turned into a monster. I don't know how it happened. Um, I know it's about shape and weight and tone, but it's still, I am a little suspicious of saying, that's it. But it's also, um, you know, Mesopotamian. Um, I mean, it, it's all, but it's just so many things jumbled up. It, I mean, to me, it's like poetry. You can't just say, okay, this poet, poem means this. It only means this, and that's it. I mean, I think they're amusing at this point. You do. Um, you, now, um, the women, but I... Um, many people thought so then, and some... But, and with some so. people, they were, you know, the, the reviews were just... You know, they were hideous. But, um, well, Elaine, um, there was one in which um, it looked like uh, there were uh, bullet holes in the, in the image. And Elaine, I don't know whether this is what she said was in fact true, but she said, oh no, um, Bill was looking at a, a photograph of stick on rubies in Harper's Bazaar. And well, maybe he was. I mean, um, but I, I guess I, I don't like pinning things down much. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was angry at Bill from time to time, um, you know. Well, they did, I should say, they did separate. They, they did, were yes, separated in, in for, in fact, most of their lives. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, but she, she always admired his work and his precepts. I mean, mm -hmm. he really, he sat her down, taught her how to, how to paint objects. You know, he, mm -hmm. he spent a lot of time uh, teaching her how to, how to paint a still life. And she said it would give her a headache, you know, because he would, was so intense about, you know, his instruction. But um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I just think people are so complex. I, yes, I agree. It's very difficult to just say it, every, this is this Oh, and I that's don't mean that. for you to say that. I just mean to say, are there components of this? There's a story I love. I, maybe it's from your book where Bill actually had a daughter with another woman. And Elaine, in her usual large-hearted way, went to the hospital, right, with flowers to give to the woman. They had been separated. They weren't divorced, but separated for years. She had plenty of lovers of her own. She, but then she was so irritated by seeing the fact that the woman was registered as Mrs. de Kooning <laughs> that she, when she looked at the baby, she told the woman, ah, looks like Jackson Pollock. <laughs> oh, it's not in my book. No, oh, no okay. <laughs> but so she had her, but, I just, I, it, it was an, I like the idea that she had a little edge also. So. Oh, she, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, she, she did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What about her as a writer? Uh, this is terribly important. She began working for Art News in 48, is that right? Mm -hmm. And it's very unusual to have an artist deep in the scene, steeped in the work, 
writing criticism. I think the criticism only goes on for about a year before she feels she shouldn't. But then she is writing feature stories. Very impressive stuff from what I've, it has, a lot of it has been republished. How much impact did it have at the time? What did it mean that she was also a writer as well as a painter? Well, that is a good question. Um, I don't know that it really had enormous impact mm -hmm. at the time. Um, I'm really looking at it, you know, from this distance. Mm -hmm. You know, she took on Clement Greenberg, for example, um, in one essay. She never mentioned his name, but you would know because she's writing about flatness mm -hmm. in art, and that was his big thing. And I, I just love what I think of as her right. eye level sense of things. She's so practical. Right. You know, she said, um, she said that um, the only time that we really have to think of flatness is um, when we're setting a table or driving a car. And I, I just love the disarming quality of right. that. Um, I mean, she, she goes deeper, but it, it's hard to just you know, yeah. paraphrase. I took a couple of quotes. So this is her quotes of Elaine from, from the, of Elaine de Kooning from the book. One tends to say Elaine, which sounds terribly over familiar, but since they're both de Kooning, it gets very confusing. But you write, again, this, I, this is from your book, um, the article that, was t that took on Clement Greenberg, where she talks about um, abstract expression. It's ac abstract expressionists, she says, were actually abstract impressionists who were reviving an older style. And instead of painting, I thought this was very good, the optical effects of nature, they're painting the optical effects of spiritual states, which I thought was rather beautiful. And I love this. She says of El Greco, he loved his own brush strokes as much as the tears in the eyes of his saints or rather, tears for him were brush strokes. She was really a writer. I mean, yeah, yeah. She was really. She had tremendous feeling for other people's work. She did. Even even when she didn't really like it, mm -hmm. she found something interesting to mm -hmm. say about it. I think I'll just have to take my word Which word for it because it, otherwise generosity. I'd be reading you reams and reams. But yeah, as long as we're talking about her generosity and and you mentioned it in later life. I, got, I recently wrote, uh, wrote some, a review of another book that involved Elaine de Kooning and a bunch of these women. And I got a letter from someone who said she's 10 years younger than this group. And she just wanted me to know how really horrible Helen Frankenthaler was to all other women around her. And this woman said she had uh, the same gallery. Um, and her first show sold out. And Frankenthaler was so mad that she was coming over to the gallery and the gallery owner told this painter she had to leave quickly. And not only did she have to leave quickly so she wouldn't be there, she couldn't take the elevator just in case there was a run-in in the elevator. She had to take the back <laughs> stairs and get out of her own sold out show. So I was a little more than I expected, but it's interesting to get on the ground perspective. But she does seem to have been a different story. She really seems to have been a nurturer, an encourager of other women, uh, maybe because she wasn't so intensely focused only on the painting because, I think she said it herself, she would have been a greater painter had she been interested in fewer things. That she just, the world was large and full of birdsong for her is what you feel. So is that true about her generosity toward other women too? Yes, yes. I mean, there's so many instances. There's um, a fellow, uh, I'm saying a fellow, but another woman painter um, uh, who was going through a bad time in her life. And Elaine went to her gallery, picked out a print. Dealer was on the phone. So Elaine scribbles a check and leaves it. And, and, mm. and she would just do these things. And she, right. would, um, she mentored uh, uh, several younger painters. Um, what else did she do? Um, well, I mean, it's all in, in great contrast with her flouncy ways as a, as a young woman, it, it took her quite a while to grow into this generosity. But she was much admired by the younger women painters, was she not? I mean, she was a real example to them. No, not so um, much? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I, it's something I really didn't go into. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, There are admiring quotes from Grace Hardigan, your other big well, Grace, subject about. But they were this, I mean, Grace was born 22, so same. Mm -hmm. age. I don't really know much about it. I should have looked into it, I mm -hmm. guess, um, you know, what younger 
a younger generation felt. Talk about, can you talk about her glamour and if that mattered? That's what Grace Hardigan talks about a little bit. Well, as a young woman, um, you know, she would wear the cinch belts and, and you know, her, the red hair. And, um, and of course, it's, it's more than your clothing. It's how you carry yourself. And um, she was a flirt. She, would, uh, you know, she was a lifelong smoker. And she would just stand there with her cigarette waiting for some man to light it. And I mean, you know, um, all these little, these little gestures that she would, she would carry on. Um, um, I mean, she liked having men flock around. And um, somehow in her later life, she was able, she had some good women friends, but it was always the men that she, she cared about. And, and yet, I mean, she had, she had affairs with um, Thomas Hess, and, one with Hess and um, who ran Art News? Who ran Art News? Yes, and uh, with with Rosenberg, um, the critic. They were both married, and, and of course she was still she she was always married. She never divorced. Um, they never divorced. Um, but these were, you know, these were just sort of things that came and went. I I think she rather liked not being terribly close to anyone. My mm. sense was she was always preserving part of herself mm. to to herself. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Somebody was asking about the Kennedy portraits. Why don't you say how that astonishing commission came about? Well, Kennedy uh, was famously restless, and, and the word was out that um, Elaine would paint very quickly. <laughs> so it was perfect, right? And um, there, there was also a connection. Her, her dealer um, was a friend of one of JFK's brothers in prep school, you know, one of the old school Thai kind of things. And, so, um, so she was proposed, and so she went down to the Winter White House in late December of 1962, and she claimed, you know, and this is the thing, I mean, um, when you write biographies, the, your subject is always claiming things that is just, just pretty ridiculous, you know. So she claimed she spent four weeks there. Well, she didn't spend four weeks. She spent a few days. And the thing is, because it's JFK, you, you go to the JFK library, and you know exactly what he did every day. There's a diary. And so, he, but so he's restless. He's meeting with all these people. He's you know, writing. He's, and then he, he has his back problems. So he's, he doesn't even sit still. And um, so she's, she finally climbed up on a ladder while he was having a meeting with somebody, um, you know, she's, she's sketching, she's sketching in charcoal and pencil and this and that. And, um, and the funny thing is that I guess the whoever she was meeting, uh, he, JFK was meeting with, just thought she was, you know, part of the scenery or something. And, and um, so there's just all these little anecdotes in the book about how all that happened. And, and then, how was the official portrait chosen out of all the versions she made? Well, there's sort of, there actually were two. Um, I mean, the thing is, as I was pointing out uh, earlier, um, she gets back to New York um, after just a few sittings with a, lots of little drawings and things. And she winds up painting dozens and dozens of JFKs. There's this mm -hmm. photo um, that ran in Life magazine of her in her studio, just surrounded. They're, you know, they're on the floor, they're on the wall, they're everywhere. And, um, but the difficulty she had, too, is that um, you know, he was, this is the, uh, his relaxation. He was wearing casual clothes, but this is an official portrait. So then she had to figure out, she had to look at some photos of him wearing a jacket. I mean, he wasn't, you know, formally attired in Palm Beach. Um, and, um, and just even the way he was sitting, he was, uh, he was sitting in such a way that he was exposing his crotch in one um, at one point, and she said, well, you, you, you sure you want to sit like that? Mr. And, President, you know, are you, you know, sure? And he had no problem with it, you know. Um, by the way, there was no, uh, they had no relationship or any, you know, and she wore very, very prim clothes to this assignment. It's interesting. Um, but um, so it, there was a lot of back and forth about um, the people came from his office to look at the work, and they were not happy because um, you know, nothing seemed presidential enough. And in, in the end, I mean, just to, it's, it's a whole chapter in the book, but in the end, there were, there were two official portraits. And one, one was chosen, you know, the, whole, the point was it was chosen for the um, Truman Library. And the Truman portrait is, is just a small portrait. Um, I, I would just like to, in a minute, read you just a little bit uh, something she said at the, uh, at the unveiling of that. But the really, the really cool one uh, is at the... Um, 
the National Portrait Gallery. And as I said earlier, for, forgive me for repeating, but um, you know, you walk through the gallery, uh, it's a permanent gallery, of you know, all the presidents just looking all very presidential as you would expect. And then there's this colossal, it's seeming, portrait of JFK in very vivid colors, you know, slashing brush, brush strokes. Um, she had this thing about his eyes. She, she felt that the blue of his eyes somehow leaked into the rest, I mean, rest of his uh, eye. I mean, it just, she would have these theories. These, she believed that people had certain colors they carried around with them. And, um, but anyway, um, so to me that's, and I think to, to most people, that's the really great one. But um, she was so conscious um, of uh, the fact that she had, even, even the one at the Truman Library was not a traditional portrait. And of course, Truman himself probably hated it, uh, who knows. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a photo in the book of, of Truman and uh, Elaine. They look like they're sharing a joke. Um, but so she understood that the people at the gathering uh, were probably thinking, oh, you know. Um, and she said, uh, I'm afraid that it may take a bit of getting used to. Um, and then she explained that when we look at someone, we, uh, we take notes in shorthand. And she said, that's why we immediately recognize the subject of a caricature. But while caricature, a caricature is always ir irreverent, a portrait is full of reverence for the uniqueness of the man being portrayed. Mm. Um, and she said, uh, and she talked about her work on the portrait. And then she said, my aim was not to convey a realistic sense of a gray flannel suit worn by a man with a tan. Uh, but rather to communicate the brightness and high color of John F. Kennedy as I saw him. She sought to capture his quality of readiness as though he was about to spring from his chair and to try to get the frown and the smile at once, the sharp appraising glance. Um, and she said, because he was, <clears throat> because he was always in motion, um, he slipped past us, she said, and so, President Truman, I offer you not a portrait of John F. Kennedy, but a glimpse. It's just so elaine. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's really wonderful. And, it, and a glimpse does also capture something essential about the person. I think, and this is again from you, but from you quoting Elaine de Kooning at a different point. She says somewhere, what's the difference between a photograph and a painted portrait. The photograph will give you the moment, but the portrait should give you a sense of the 10 years leading up to it and the 10 years after, which I thought was just, sort of the yeah. opposite of a glimpse, but it's really, equally, I know. She, she it's was, equally <laughs> wonderful. She would contradict herself that yeah. way, but yeah. yeah. Are we on can time? For yes. She seems to have been Miss New York, the center of it all. She was involved in every club and every discussion, writing, painting, the social life. And then in the late 50s, the art world changes completely. Um, the pop artists begin to come in. The art market, Jackson Pollock is dead. His prices go through the roof. The art market becomes to, begins to become the commercial horror story we know it to be. And a lot of these artists are terribly discouraged, and they leave. And at that point, she too begins to teach elsewhere, To her sure. life changes completely. You want to talk about that? Well, um, she was also, after, in, in 57, she leaves de Kooning. And then in 58, she was, uh, got uh, a chance to teach um, at, the, at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And she fell in love with the Southwest. You know, she was used to gray verticality. And here is the expansive skies and the amazing colors of the Southwest. I had never really been there, and I thought, uh, luckily, I have a friend who lives in Santa Fe. So I went, because I really didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> and there it was, you know. Um, so uh, she met this um, a woman there, a uh, fellow uh, art, uh, no, that was the, the poet, rather, a, a poet. And the poet was very interested in bullfighting. Mm. And so um, they would drive down to um, Juarez uh, in Mexico and watch the bullfights. And that um, she uh, she had uh, yes grown up in Brooklyn, but her uh, family had a farm upstate in New York, and so she used to like to draw cows, 
And bulls were so much more exciting than Ugh. cows. Um, and she, she loved uh, people, people in motion, animals in motion. And bulls just had that, you know, the ripply contours that fascinated her. And of course, they were in action. I mean, she's watching, you know, the bullfights. And so, it, it, interestingly, she wasn't real, very interested in, you know, the picador or the matador. She was just interested in the bull. Some of her paintings have these little skinny fellows. Oh, yes, you know. But it, it's the bull that she cared about. And so, she painted them over and over. And um, and does that lead to these cave paintings she did later well, on? Well, kind of. I mean, she's just interested in, in animals. I mean, not that she was somebody who had pets, but um, later in her life when she was in Spain and France and saw these, you know, caves, she sort of picked up the same, you know, oh, animals again. And she did these sort of palimpsest-type paintings with layers of, you know, animal figures. Um, the sports paintings you showed, which some of them look a little like Leroy Neiman's, you know, the, you know. <laughs> the, the animals. She's nowhere near any of the official art movements that are now sort of clamped onto everything and to which everything has to belong, which seems to me at least one reason why she, she falls off the radar completely, right. even though she comes to New York sometimes. So now that we're post, 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 post all this, do I, and we're not clamping things down, and, and I know that you, Joan Mitchell is a genius, but, but these women are gifted, and I, I was just at Christie's the other day, there's a beautiful, big Joan Mitchell on the wall. The price is 12 to $16 million. Um, so she's already in the stratosphere. Do you see any forthcoming revival of Elaine de Kooning in the, in the work? Wait, um, I mean, not to, you know, sort of be contradictory or something, but, but Joan really, she developed, if I may call her Joan, <laughs> as I call Elaine, Elaine, um, uh, she really developed her own style. I mean, that was, oh, every single painting by her is, is, is an event. It's, she was just terribly important, and I don't know about the money. I mean, that's it's just insane, these prices, but um, Elaine, just um, it's a, it's a it's a lesser talent, but I don't care. <laughs> um, I'm not really out to just find the superstars of yesteryear. Um, she's so interesting as a person, and she. I mean, what I leave the reader with is the sense that it's a, it's a very much of a dog eat dog world. I don't use that <laughs> dreadful phrase in the book, but and she was somebody who created a kind of bomb. She she helped artists. She was not competitive with them. Yeah. She made it better, not worse. You succeed yeah. very well in the book in getting this across, and as I said, making me sort of wish I could invite her over. Mm. Um, could you give, give us a little preview of the next book? Because you've done now, it will be a trio of women artists. You started with Grace Hardigan, then Elaine de Kooning, and now Nell Blaine, of whom even less is known than either of these other two. Well, um, Nell was from Virginia, um, born in 1922, and uh, she came to New York uh, as, uh, a, as a 20 year old and uh, became you know, quite successful in, in the 50s, got one of her paintings um, purchased by the Whitney. And um, she oh, hung out with poets and she had a rather wild life. Um, she had um, relationships with men and with women and she was very interested in jazz and she, she herself played the drums and she was just incredibly active. And then she got together enough money to go to Greece in 1959. And at that, uh, uh, she came down with polio. And oh. um, she had had only two of the shots. You had to have three shots, three inoculations, and she had only two of them. And she got the very worst kind of polio you can get, spinal bulbar, bulbar polio. She um, nearly died. And you know, it was very primitive there in, in Greece, in Mykonos. She, that's where she was. And so she was airlifted and long story. It's a whole chapter in the book. Well, she became a paraplegic in New York before the American Disability Act. And it was just to get around, she, she, you know, to get to the art shows, to, to, to get out. To, um, the, the apartment where she was living was a walk-up. She couldn't live there anymore. She moved to Riverside Drive, where she lived uh, for the rest of her life. And, um, at that point, and it's just sort of interesting too in her personal life, she having, she then um, had women only uh, as partners. One was her nurse uh, at the hospital um, who became her, her, 
her lover for a number of years, who left her very abruptly for another woman, and then this other woman uh, who remained and who, uh, with her to the end of her life. Um, and so it was wonderful. I was able to speak to both of these women, and I learned you know, a great deal about what it was like. And just, um, I mean, this is not, not about art anymore, but I mean, the, the, the caretakers, the long, 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 long list of all these women who would come and be interviewed, you know, the ad would be placed, the interview would happen, they would seem to be, she always liked to think positively, and then some dreadful thing would happen. I mean, um, either the, the, woman, the women didn't, uh, you know, hated uh, cripples, or, uh, you know, couldn't lift her, or, or, you know, would disappear for days on end. I mean, over and over and over for years and years, just the, the struggle. <laughs> it's just, Did she but continue? Oh, she's she continued to paint. And the, the wonderful thing about her is that, for my money, um, now Carolyn, her last lover, and I d disagree about this, but I think the paintings, her, the post polio paintings, are the brilliant ones. Huh. Um, she had to teach herself how to paint again, really. She painted watercolors with her right hand. Um, and then, I think that's right, and then um, with her left hand, she was able to uh, paint and it's much smaller. You know, she, was, she would run across the room to the canvas in her early days, and now, of course, she's in her wheelchair, and, but she could paint in oil with her other hand. But it's not like a sort of a sob story, oh, isn't that nice? It's that she um, became a simpler painter, and um, by simplifying, she really, she became one of America's, I would say, great watercolorists. Um, so it's, it's, it's rather an interesting story. When does this book come out? Uh, July. I can't wait. Do we, it's time for questions, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Questions? Oh, well, if you can speak up. Okay. Then. <laughs> okay. So you touched on this in your talk, but I wonder if you can drill down a little more on her relationship to the art wars, because as you were saying that everything was clamped down, it was virtually ideological. And I mean, not only was she you know, not going to be with the next art movement of pop art, colorful, yeah. you know, those new areas that everybody had to be part of, but she was a portraitist you know, when everything was supposed to be abstract. Did people give her a hard time? Did she feel that she needed to explain herself, explain her art, justify it because of those ideological lines that were drawn in those days? Well, to some extent, yes. I mean, being a portraitist was the lowliest of the low in a way. I mean, it was to be a hack, to, you know, um, so that was problematic, um, but she, she just had a great force of will and just did whatever she wanted to do. I mean, she always did whatever she wanted to do, whether it was a good idea or, or not. Um, um, I feel I'm, I'm not really answering your question, I realize, but. It did take a number of years for her to get a one person show. Oh yeah, in terms of showing, yeah. But she kind of, she was so ambivalent, it seems. There was one time when she had a dealer in, in Washington, D.C., and she, um, we just wanted the, it was in a very prominent location, and she wanted the window to just say E de K, which is how she signed the paintings. And the dealer said, well, nobody knows who that is, but she refused to have her full name on there. I mean, she would kind of shoot herself in the foot in a way. Um, I don't know, she just kind of made her own, own world. I mean, she was very unworld, unworldly about success. and. Um, she didn't, you know, she didn't make much money. Of course, nobody really did in, in those beginning years. She, you know, she got handouts from, from Bill, and um, she spent, always spent much more than she made. And her, you know. Did have a hard time at the Cedar Tavern, for example? I don't, yeah. I don't sort of think so, because, because of who she was as a also person. Also because she yeah. was a woman. She wasn't expected to be a heavy hitter mm, like true. Joan Mitchell was. Joan Mitchell would you know, slug you. Elaine de Kooning would charm you. And I think she was adored at the Cedar Tavern, but as a figure. As a person, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't really have much more to add. Yeah. Oh.
was your father Caldus? Yeah. Ah, Aristodemus Caldus. Oh yeah, he pa she painted your father more than anybody else. Right. Yep. Yes, uh, he was Greek, uh, Aristodemus Caldus, K-A-L-D-I-S. Where is the portrait now? It's in the That's wonderful. Thank you. Her inner life, <laughs> what it was, <laughs> a thing I could never get at. Oh, what, what do I think is, was the most complicated thing about Elaine de Kooning? It's always the, you know, the thing that, as a biographer, you, you can never really know. But as I, I you know, I, I'm just saying, you know, it was her, her inner life. She was really, at, you know, at some level, I know everyone is at some level unknowable, but, you know, what really was her secret sorrow? What was, what really drove her? Because she was driven. Um, she was a driven person. I mean, very kind, yes. But she was in constant motion and needed always to be with people. And, you know, it's that type of, that personality. And I always think there's got to be something that triggers that, you know. Well, um, oh, um, is there one of, of the paintings I showed, which are from the book, is there one that's regarded as her best abstract work and her best portrait? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I would certainly say the JFK portrait, which she put in such, you know, energy and love into. She, she adored him, his, his politics, who he was, his, the way he looked, everything. Um, the one that's at the National Portrait Gallery that you can actually go and see. Um, and I think the, um, the bull a painting that's um, uh, at the Whitney, though you can't see it, um, um, I mean, I think that's one of the, the strongest abstract ones, I think, are, are the bulls. Um, um, that just that, you know, this swirl of energy as she was, you know, watching the, the bull. And, in, in I'd action. like to cast a vote, too, for some things that were not known at the time, and I don't know when they were found, and they are drawings of Bill de Kooning <laughs> naked and asleep. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that are just yes. her draftsmanship, the tender, I don't know where they are. They are gorgeous, just. Of, of Bill, Bill de, Kooning, de Kooning, naked yes. and asleep. Oh yes, that, um, I wish I don't know where where they where they are. That's beautiful, but drawings. they're um, but obviously were kept private until everybody was gone. Yeah. Where oh, they've been reproduced. There's a big book of Elaine de Kooning portraits, and you, they're reproduced there. The, the National Portrait Gallery had a show of her portraits, very handy for me, a few years ago, and there's a big catalog that you can still get.
You know, it's interesting with the Aladar one, she claimed that she was painting the healthy Aladar. She, see, as part of her mindset, she knew he had AIDS. Eventually, she did know this, and by then she knew it, but not, you know, in her mind. Yeah. Someone in the back? She, she had a thing about zoos as well. When in Paris, she liked to go to the zoo. And um, there's a little anecdote there about she had gotten this red bag, and she would, she, for some reason, she was just sort of waving it in front of, gosh, what was it? Um, not a bear, but a gorilla, I think it was. Yeah, who, uh, and the, the gorilla threw up. <laughs> um, and she actually came back the next day and waved the bag again, and he encored. So. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, she was very smart, the mother was, and you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it, her mother, um, it, it, Elaine was the firstborn, and her. Um, mother didn't have her until three and a half years after she married. And so I think <coughs> it was perhaps that as well was a special attachment. But Elaine felt as well that she was the favorite. So. Yes. And she did um, constantly give, despite everything, she was constantly giving her mother money and throughout the years, because her mother separated from, uh, from her father at some point. One last question. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.